this panel. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, I think it's really, I've heard a lot of great discussions about how we build a movement and how we create, um, how we create the kind of profound social changes that we need. And I thought that, that uh, in Michelle's talk, I mean, she really did a good job of explaining how deeply ingrained some of these injustices are, and this requires a pretty complex and comprehensive response. I look forward to all of us being part of that. Um, uh, as Kate explained, my main work is on the international part, and we do a lot of it is involved. We work on, on uh, human rights in Haiti, but a big part of Haiti's human rights problems uh, start around here in New York and Washington and other wealthy cities where decisions about Haitian rights are made. And so part of my mission is really to, to bring the fight for justice, the Haitians' fight for justice, uh, to the international community, especially the United States. And I've got kind of four takeaways from this talk, uh, and then I'll talk, I'll give you what the four takeaways are, then I'll maybe talk a little bit about my own, my own career path, and then we can, um, and then maybe talk a little bit more back to the four takeaways. But the first takeaway is, is in terms of your career, you should plan and prepare for your career, but be prepared for unexpected opportunities. And that's kind of, the, I, I've done a much better job about taking advantage of unexpected opportunities than I have been planning and preparing. Um, but it, you know, it's worked as well as if I had planned and prepared, but I think you should really do need to do both. And second, um, I'd, I'd second what Davida Finger said today about that it is possible to have a, a very fulfilling uh, and rewarding career. Um, and I think that we should all insist on having a, a fulfilling and rewarding career, but I also think that we should be uh, ready to be flexible as to exactly what, what is fulfilling and, and rewarding. Um, I think the, the third, my third takeaway is, is you should always be confident that you have a role doing human rights work but you should never be certain that whatever you're doing at a particular time is the right thing to do. And I think it's a process of continually questioning that, never knowing sure you're, the only time you know you're, you're, you can be certain is if you're certain you're right, then you're certainly wrong. Um, and the fourth, my fourth takeaway is, uh, is fill your toolbox. Try to develop, you obviously need to develop, um, develop good legal skills. If, 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 you're, if you're a lawyer, um, but you also should think about other, other tools in your toolbox, especially language, um, different public advocacy skills, technology skills, and, uh, and fundraising skills. <clears throat> um, so I, I started, as uh, Katie said, I started my career in 1995. I worked for the UN as a human rights um, observer. The way I got there, I, when I got out of law school, I wasn't sure what I'd done because I hadn't gone to events like this. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. And um, worked for a firm, paid off uh, for a few years, paid down most of my loans, and um, then decided it was time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Spent about a year trying to figure that out, decided it was human rights work, and spent another year trying to find a job while I was doing some travel and volunteer. And I ended up getting the Haiti, the Haiti job was the first one I got, and kind of back to the toolbox. A big reason why I got that was because, well, because I could say on my resume I spoke French, which isn't exactly the same thing as speaking French. It was very rusty at the time, but I did have, have some, albeit rusty, language skills, and I think that's really what got my, my foot in the door. And the, the U, working for the UN was actually a very good entry into Haiti because what we were doing was going around and talking to people and, and saying, what are your human rights problems? And we talked to local leaders, grassroots leaders, uh, judges, prosecutors, the local priest, the mayor, and that was a really good way of learning about Haiti. It wasn't a good way, that, that good a way of getting human rights work done because what, when I got there, this was after there had been a dictatorship in Haiti and uh, the mission had been originally, the UN mission had been set up during the dictatorship and it was kind of a reporting mission. And, but there was no real massive human rights violations to report anymore, but that's what we were still doing. And we'd go and we talk to the Haitians and they'd say, what are your human rights problems? Uh, is the army after you? And they'd say, no, you know, the army's been disbanded. Is the paramilitaries after you? No, the paramilitaries have gone underground. What we really need to do is, to, but they're still there, so we need to prosecute them. Oh, we can't prosecute them because we're, we're, um, we're the UN and that's too complicated. They said, well, what about our you know, social and economic human rights? Oh no, those aren't our human rights. And, and so then there'd be a point in the interview where you know, we'd get the, what good are you look? And we'd say, oh, we're gonna write up a report about this. And this is gonna go straight to New York. And then we get the same you know, repeat of the, of the what good are you look. And, and eventually that kind of got through my thick head and, and I started thinking, well, maybe we're not really doing anything that useful. And so I left the, um, 
I left the UN and kind of on the way out the door, and this is sort of the being ready for unexpected, just a friend of mine who had been in my orientation, I ran into her, at, uh, she'd been in my orientation class with the UN. She said, oh, I'm working for this group called the Bureau des Aves Contournats, you know, or BAI. Why don't you come down and look at it? It's pretty neat. So I came down and looked at it, and, and they were doing, they were actually doing what all the Haitians had said they, we needed to do, which was to prosecute human rights cases. And so I, I, was, I was on my way back to, to, to Boston, and I went back, and, but I kept, I kept offering volunteer, to volunteer for them. Uh, there was, you know, they had some research projects, and I really started liking that. And finally, uh, after I was back in the States for a couple months, they said, well, we really want to do this case called the Rabateau case. And, and, and I've been involved in monitoring the Rabateau case when I was working for the UN. We want you to come down and, 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 and spearhead it. Uh, and I said, okay, fine. And we mutually agreed that I'd be there for all of June of 1996. <laughs> and June turned into July, and 1996 turned into 1997. And, and here I am in 2012, still working on, on, the, on that. Um, and it was because I kept, I, if you had told me in mid June of 1996 that I would have been there through the end of the year, I would have said, you're crazy. Uh, but in Haiti, there was a combination of. At first, we thought we were going to get the case done in three months, and that was about um, twenty. That was about four years too too ambitious. Um, but in Haiti, there was always some opportunity to to really do good things, and we didn't always take advantage. We didn't always realize those opportunities, but we we did enough. And that Roberto case, when eventually went to trial in two thousand, um, is by far the best complex prosecution in Haiti's history. We we were able to. To to uh, to convict the top. There's one here. There's one chair. And what about with the bag? The bag is in my spot. Yes, it is. He left. I don't know. Yes. I'm about to go back. Sorry. Okay. Um, and we were able to prosecute the top military and paramilitary officials, including getting three generals deported from the U.S., including the highest ranked military officer ever deported from the U.S. We got about $400,000 for our clients from one of the generals who had actually won the Florida lottery. Um, and we were able to, through our work and through lots of other people working to make the justice system work for poor people, we were actually able to make quite a bit of changes in the eight years I was working at the BAI. Uh, but those changes were mostly um, were mostly eliminated or, or sharply pushed back in 2004 when um, our president sent the plane for Haiti's president. It was one of those planes that was used in the in the uh, the rendition of people to get tortured in part of the war against terror. Um, it was diverted from from those rounds, sent to Guantanamo Bay, fall, filed a false flight plan, forced Haiti's president on it, and went to the Central African Republic. And when that happened, the the, the nine years of democratic progress, by far the, the largest uh, period of democratic progress in Haiti's history, was, was, uh, was sharply reversed. And it occurred to me that at that time, as an American, um, as much as I liked li working in Haiti and living in Haiti, my role was not to be uh, in Haiti anymore. My role was to use the lessons that I had learned and the relationships I developed in my nine years of Haiti to come back to really bring the, uh, the the Haitian fight to justice to our country, because it was clear that nothing would ever be sustainable in Haiti, no progress would be sustainable in Haiti as long as the U.S. was able to to uh, reverse it on on a win. And um, and so I've been since 2004. We've been we've been we've we've founded this organization IJDH, and it was a little bit of a reversal of the of the typical way of doing things. Often you have a a, a, a organization in a wealthy country where the money is uh, find, establishes a, an affiliate in the, in the poor country. In Haiti, we did it the opposite. We, we had the BAI, which is our existing, we founded IJDH as, a, as an affiliate of BAI, and our purpose was to, to try to take the BAI's fight to the international community and also to, uh, to raise money for, for the BAI. Um, in terms of, of kind of what we do on a, on a daily basis, let me do a couple introductions. So Mario Joseph, who, who co-managed uh, the BAI with me for, for eight years, and is now the managing attorney of the BAI. Uh, and then Bia, who's a new staff attorney for us at IGDH, and she spent uh, a year at the BAI. Um, and then we have Osokra, who's a finissant, which is a, an apprentice lawyer at, at the BAI. And uh, Lindsay Laveau is a about to start, I guess she's officially started on Monday as a, a summer associate um, 
for us at the, the BAI office. Am I missing one? Okay. Um, anyway, so, so we've got kind of this team. We work very closely together with the BAI and IGDH. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting and innovative partnership where almost all of our projects, we work, um, we work together in a, in a, inextricably. You know, one example is one of our cases, our biggest case now, is, it's, um, it's against the UN for, for bringing cholera to Haiti. And for people who haven't followed this, um, Haiti is rare among countries in the hemisphere. It had never had a reported case of cholera until um, it was brought by the UN peacekeeping mission in, in, um, in uh, October of 2010. And this is a peacekeeping mission where one in ten UN peacekeepers are in the Haiti mission, and it's under Chapter 7, which is, you know, great for to international peace. And this is in a country that has not had a recognized war in my lifetime. Um, it's spending $800 million on, 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 you know, on guns and gasoline to drive people with guns around the city. Um, it did not have the money to put in a, a basically 19th century sewer system, and it, nor to test or treat peacekeepers being deployed from their home country where there was a cholera epidemic. They sent them to a base where the, where the sewage was literally re leaking right into the top of Haiti's largest river system. Um, there's been, um, officially, it's, I think it's 7,300 people have been killed. Most people think that's probably not that much. It's by far the worst cholera epidemic in the world and, and is completely a result of, of, of reckless behavior by the UN. And um, what we're doing on that is we filed up, the UN has some immunity, uh, that's why we're wearing these, um, and um, so we, fought, we weren't able to file in Haitian courts, but we're filing, we filed with the UN internal mechanisms itself, and we are, um, the, the plan is to, if the UN does not give us, our clients, a fair hearing with their own internal mechanisms, then we're going to be able to go to a national court and say their, their human right to a remedy has been, has been, um, has been ignored, and under the immunity agreement, the, the immunity provision should be waived. Um, and, but right now, so the way we did that, uh, Mario and his team in Haiti, they went through actually representing 5,000 clients, which is scary, so doing anything by 5,000 times, um, but it made an impact. And, and, and the, the other problem is Mario's got, you know, he's probably got like 30,000 people banging down his door saying, sign me up too, because people are really excited about this opportunity for justice in Haiti because they feel the injustice so so badly. Um, and so Mario does the work of, of getting the clients and all the, 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 the basically building the case. On this end in the US, we do a lot of legal research on trying to figure out how we're going to get into, uh, into a national court. We do a lot of work with uh, UN member states trying to push them to do it, them, them to push the UN to do a better job. We work with Congress right now. There's a, a Dear Colleague letter going around Congress where uh, members of Congress are writing to uh, Ambassador Susan Rice, who's the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., telling her to, to make sure the U.N. deals with this problem. So far, I've got 50 members of Congress who have signed on, and, it, and it, we're getting more every day. Um, we do a lot of media work. Uh, we've actually been able to, just uh, three weeks ago, the New York Times had, a, had a, on Sunday Times had an editorial specifically mentioning our case and, and saying that the U.N. needs to respond justly. Uh, we've been on Al Jazeera, Democracy Now!, BBC, Canadian Broadcasting, all the U.S. networks. And we've been able to, through this combined use of, of doing the work in Haiti with the work on the ground in the U.S., um, we've actually been able to make a pretty big splash. And I'm fairly confident that this is actually going to work. What we're asking for is compensation for our clients, um, but even more importantly, um, we're, we're asking for the UN to put in a uh, clean water system for all of Haiti, which is the only way of stopping cholera. Uh, and we, um, we think that, we actually think there's a realistic chance that will happen, and that will save somewhere between. Our best calculation is within 10 years after having the water installed, it would be 50 to 70,000 lives. Because not only would that stop cholera, it would also stop um, non-cholera diseases that right now take out about, uh, about 3,000 people, mostly kids, every year. Um, and so, so um, you know, I'll just kind of, we've got two more minutes. I'll once, once again just recap what I felt were the four takeaways. First, plan and prepare for your career, but be prepared for unexpected possibilities. Second, insist on fulfillment, uh, but be flexible about that, what that means. And one of the ways that that's, I, I've needed to be flexible is that uh, I love doing human rights work, and I love doing our media work, and um, I, love most, I love most parts of my job. I never 
stop working and turn off my computer because I'm tired of working. You know, I often do it because I, I want to sleep or spend time with my family or do, do uh, you know, any of the millions of other nice things life has to offer. But I'm engaged by my, my work on a, on a permanent basis. I'm never bored. Um, but the limitation is there's some aspects of my work that I'm less good at and less interested in. I mean, I do, as, as, as an executive director, I do a decent amount of administration and finance stuff that I don't like. I do a lot of fundraising, some of which I like, some of it I don't. But it's, it is a great comfort when I'm doing, you know, looking at some spreadsheet that I don't like doing, that me looking at that spreadsheet is helping, you know, Mario and Bia and, um, and Lindsay and Sokra have them do great work on the ground for human rights. And so sometimes I think you need to look at the big picture and you might, your particular contribution in any one minute might not be the best, the most interesting thing you could do, but it is part of a, of a, of a, bigger, of a bigger machine. Um, the, the third takeaway is, is always be confident that you have a role, but never be certain that you are, you are doing the right thing. And I've continually had to evaluate my role, and I think that, you know, I evaluated the UN and decided that my role was not appropriate what I was doing. At the BAI, I, mean, I think it was appropriate, but not as any result. I mean, there's no reason why uh, U.S. lawyers should be permanently in Haiti. What the U.S. lawyers should do if you go to a place like Haiti is help out do two things, one, train people to take your place, and two, learn things so you can bring the fight back to, to your own country. Um, and then with, with IJDH, we're always struggling to figure out what is the, 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 the ideal relationship of us with poor people's struggles, with Haiti, and with kind of the broader picture of human rights. Um, and the fourth takeaway is just fill your toolbox. I mean, I'm using skills that, that I mean, I've had to, especially as a director, for a while I was the only employee of IJDH, and, and so I had to do a little bit of everything. Um, and, but there's lots of things that I've had to develop my skills. There's other things that I, skills that I had and didn't think I'd use, and they ended up, they ended up becoming useful. So I think that you, I just encourage everybody to be flexible and to try to develop um, as, many, as many skills for your toolbox as you can have. Um, and that's it, other than just to reiterate that you really can find uh, you know, exciting, fulfilling work in, in, in doing human rights, although it's not always easy. Thank you.